antes de venir como el justo juez, vengo como el rey de misericordia. Antes de que llegue el día de la justicia, les será dado a los hombres este signo en el cielo. Se apagará toda luz en el cielo y habrá una gran oscuridad en toda la tierra. Entonces, en el cielo, aparecerá el signo de la cruz y de los orificios donde fueron clavadas las manos y los pies del Salvador. Saldrán grandes luces que durante algún tiempo iluminarán la tierra. Esto sucederá poco tiempo antes del último día. Mi llama de amor está quemando. Es tan grande que no la puedo mantener por más tiempo dentro de mí. Salta hacia ti con poder explosivo. Cuando se derrame, mi amor destruirá el odio satánico que contamina el mundo. El mayor número de almas serán liberadas. Nada como esto ha existido antes. Este es el milagro más grande que haré por todos. is what he means. It was difficult for Adam after he was expelled from the Garden of Eden to do divine acts. Number one, because he lost the preternatural gifts. He lost the ability to exercise transtemporality throughout creation. That is, he was unable for, in his soul to bilocate, trilocate into the past, present, future. But now that God's restoring this gift, it is easy for the soul to do it. All the soul has to do is with a firm will or desire and a correct or upright intention set out to do its rounds in creation. Receiving from God the source of power that enables it to multilocate and make its rounds throughout the centuries. And now when the soul does this, a sort of fusion with Jesus' humanity occurs that restores to creation God's divine harmony. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 12, May 16, 1917, 
The hours of my passion are the order of the universe. They put heaven and earth in harmony and restrain me from sending the world to ruin. As the soul does these hours of my passion, I feel my blood, my wounds, my anxieties to save souls ignited. And I feel my own life being repeated. How could souls obtain any benefit if not by means of these hours? Well, here the soul, in reenacting what Christ did, in particular his passion, co-redeems with him in an eternal dimension between heaven and earth. Now, some people say, no, we do not co-redeem. Well, guess what? Jesus disagrees with you. Turn to volume 11, November 6, 1914, where he tells Louisa, my daughter, know that by doing these hours of the passion, the soul takes my thoughts and makes them its own. It takes my reparations, my prayers, desires, affections, and even the most intimate fibers of my heart and makes them its own. And rising between heaven and earth, it carries out my own office and as co-redeemer, it says with me, Ecce hego mitteme, here I am, send me. So, we reenact what Christ did by meditating on his passion, in which we make our thoughts, his thoughts, our own. His anxieties are own, his prayers are own, his desires are own. In this eternal dimension between heaven and earth. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 12, June 10th, 1920, when my humanity lived on earth, it lived suspended halfway between heaven and earth. Having the entire earth beneath me and all heaven above me, by living this way, I drew all of heaven and earth to me and united them as one. Now one, the one, the ones whom I call to my likeness, I place in the same conditions in which I place my own humanity between heaven and earth. Now what does this remind you of? Well, it reminds me of the book of Revelation, the closing chapters, where we see the new Jerusalem come down from heaven and coalesce with the earth, where the two become one, in, interpenetrating. Similar to that vision of Jacob's ladder, where the angels were descending in the seven from ascending from heaven to earth and back, as if it were carrying our acts back to God. And this cohesion, this coalescence between heaven and earth was a reality before original sin in Eden. Adam beheld God face to face, Jesus tells Louisa. Now, the soul that meditates on these hours in particular not only participates in Jesus in such a way that Jesus' thoughts become its thoughts, but it vicariously immolates itself through, with, and in Jesus for the sins of mankind and like Jesus, acquires the merit as if all were saved. Now, this seems like a flighty teaching but it's very real, it's very solid, spiritually speaking, that we can merit the reward as if everyone was saved and no one was lost. Some of you think, well, how is this possible? We know that souls are in hell from Fatima, from Faustina Kowalska's revelations, who went to hell and saw souls there. When Mary opened the earth at Fatima and revealed to the three shepherd children souls in hell. We know it from Louisa's writings where he tells her that Judas was lost and others, other approved writings of the church. So how is it possible, given the fact that souls are damned for all eternity, that anyone, much less we poor sinners, can merit the reward as if all were saved? How is this possible? Well, let me allow Jesus and Louisa to provide that answer for you. On October 1914, Louisa relates, 
Another time I was complaining to Jesus. Well, this is true. Louisa did that a lot with Jesus. You know, she complained a lot, but out of love. She was a loving, complaining Italian, just like the rest of the Italians. And because after so many sacrifices in writing these hours of the Passion, she writes, very few souls were reading them. And Jesus answered, my daughter, do not complain. Even if there were but one, you should be content. Would I not have suffered my whole passion, even if only one soul were saved? The same applies to you. One should never omit good, because few avail themselves of it. But all harm awaits those who do not take advantage of it. And just as my passion made my humanity acquire the merit as if all were saved, I receive merit according to what I desire to accomplish, and not according to the profit souls would draw from it. The same applies to you. You will be rewarded according to how your will was united with mine in wanting to do good to all. So you see, God looks at our intention. This is extremely important. Because, and yet, it is very overlooked, the importance of intention. And it's so important that I want to break from the scene momentarily of redoing and reenacting in the divine will and focus my and your attention on the writings of this, this of Saint Faustina Kowalska. Now, there are several passage here, passages here that I did not plan to share with you, but I'm pulling them up as I'm speaking here. And I have a working memory of where these passages are found in her Diary of Divine Mercy, which I've read several times. And um, it won't take me long to share them with you. Here we go. This is from Entry 800. Now remember, this is the writings of a mystic who's declared a saint. If one does not know what is better, one must reflect, consider, and seek advice. Okay. Here Faustine is telling you and me how important the intention is in acting, regardless of the outcome. And this ties into how we can receive the merit of, of the reward as if all were saved, though all are not saved. So she writes, if one does not know what is better to do, one must reflect, consider, and seek advice. Now this is important because here the soul is going out of its way to inform its conscience. If it doesn't, it, is, it will be found guilty before God for sloth, lethargy. It didn't do anything to help form its conscience, and we all have an obligation to do so. By consulting with the teachings of the church, with a spiritual guide, and this doesn't apply just to spirituality, even medicine, concerning, let's say, the virus or the vaccine. So she writes, if one does not know what is better to do, one must reflect, consider, and seek advice. Because one must not act with an uncertain conscience. When uncertain, say to yourself, whatever I do will be good. I have the intention of doing good. The Lord God accepts what we consider good, and the Lord God also accepts and considers it as good. One should not worry if after some time one sees that these things are not good. For God looks at the intention with which we begin and will reward us accordingly. This is a principle which we ought to follow, unquote. You see, this is how God can reward a soul in eternity for having saved every soul that ever exists, even though souls are not, not all souls are saved. Because we had the intention to do it, and this is why Louisa would say, God, I pray that no one will be lost. Even though Louisa said this after Judas was lost, even though Jesus told Louisa in the hours of the Passion that Judas is lost on several occasions, she still would say, I pray that no souls are lost. Why would she say this knowing that Judas was lost? Not because she's going to take him out of hell, but because she can give God the reward as if 
the merit, the, I'm sorry, she can give God the glory as if all were not lost within her own will, in which she deposits all the acts of all souls that were poorly done that she has redone, including the acts of Judas. This is how we acquire the merit as if all were saved. So when we go to heaven, all the angels and saints will behold within our will every act perfectly done by every creature. Only two creatures were able to establish a kingdom within their will that was perfect. That is, that contained every act of every creature, rational and irrational, as if none were lost and none fell into a state of corruption. And those two creatures were Mary and Louisa. Jesus is not a creature. His humanity is creaturely, but his person is divine, uncreated. So, two human creaturely persons did this, Louisa and Mary. But, we can do it too. Not by ourselves, not by our own effort, but by the power of God's will at work in us. And all we have to do is have the right intention. Now, someone may say, wait a minute. Faustina says, whatever I do will be good and, the, and God will consider it as good. Well, what about these jihadists or these terrorists who are trained, brainwashed and taught to kill people and they're thinking they're doing good? Does that mean they're, they're good, perfect? Well, no, that's not the same thing. Why not? Because they didn't go out of their way to form their conscience. Some who do are not going to be held as guilty as those who do nothing. So that's why Faustina says at the beginning of this entry 800, if one does not know what is better to do, one must, she doesn't say may, she says must, reflect, consider, and seek advice. So if someone is at a tender age being brainwashed in a crazy, hateful ethic or religion, God's Natural law within every human being will stir their conscience to seek advice, to question what they're being told. Nobody is a robot. Everyone has a free conscience. But it is up to each and every one of us to decide whether or not to question what we're being taught. Anyone who says yes to everything does not merit eternal life. Like driftwood, they flow with the current. But a person who questions, like the Blessed Mother to the angel Gabriel, who told her she would become the mother of God by saying, how is this possible? Without contempt, but with sincere desire to know the truth, God will lead to the truth. Little by little. Now, to also emphasize the importance of intentionality here in the context of us being able to receive the merit as if all were saved by our intention to desire the salvation of all, Faustina relates in entry 822. I have come to understand today that even if I did not accomplish any of the things that the Lord is demanding of me, I know that I shall be rewarded as if I had fulfilled everything. Because he sees the intention with which I begin my work. And even if he called me to himself today, the work would not suffer at all. Because he himself is the Lord of both the work and the worker. My part is to love him to folly. All works are nothing more than a tiny drop before him. It is love that has meaning and power and merit. He has opened up great horizons in my soul. Love compensates for the chasms. She also relates an entry, 989. My Lord and my God, you know that it is you alone whom my soul has come to love. My soul is entirely drowned in you, O Lord. Even if I did not accomplish any of the things that you have made known to me, O Lord, I would be completely at peace because I would have done what I could. Unquote. So, you see, there's a theme that you should always carry with you in life when doing your acts in the divine will, redoing the acts imperfectly done by your youth, by others, 
and reenacting the acts of Jesus and Mary. And that theme is, we do our best and God will do the rest. You do your best and God will do the rest. And your best is forming the intention to always please him 24 seven, informing your conscience, of course, And God will take care of all the gaps, all those missed occasions that you were unable to do despite your best efforts. So there is in the end no cause at all for worry or fear in God's grace and in the divine will. Anyone who fears in the divine will is not living in the divine will. And I'm not talking about fear as a gift of the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about servile fear. And may God bless you and keep you always united with him in his most holy will in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for watching. We've added some additional sources for the divine will. We've added at the bottom here in, in the English-speaking category, Divine Will Era and Fiat Luisa featuring Father Celso. And also below under other languages, we've identified some excellent sources for Spanish, which we've recommended for some time now, Hijos de la Luz, de la Divina Voluntad, and Portuguese now as well, Fiat Eterno, and French, Amen Fiat. would like some help in identifying some other sites in different languages that feature Italian language videos, German, and Philippines. Put, please put them in the comments if you're aware of any recommendations you can pass on to us. Thanks again, and God bless. Let us begin with a prayer invoking the kingdom of God on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us address the importance of Mary's role in these end times during these tumultuous months of restrictions on account of a virus and that has generated some discontent, concern among many of us. Whenever we're faced with trials, we must always turn to Christ through Mary and therefore must look at Mary. It can be gleaned from the writings of the servant of God, Louisa Picareta, that the gift God wishes to give us through Mary and through Louisa of living in the divine will was not actualized in the wounded human nature of the baptized before Louisa. Now, this is found in various passages of her writings and even though this gift was not actualized in the baptized before it was imparted to the church through Louisa, the Blessed Virgin Mary assists in its actualization through Jesus' timeless humanity. You see, all the souls of all time were redeemed by Christ's timeless merits. Otherwise put, Although Christ was conceived in time 2,000 years ago, the merits of his thoughts, words, actions that impacted and divinized human nature were retroactive, influencing the patriarchs and prophets and judges of the Old Testament. They were concurrent with his present generation and they were proactive, impacting all future souls as well. Therefore, when this gift is being imparted to us from God through the Blessed Virgin Mary and Louisa, it is by virtue of Christ's timeless humanity. 
But Mary, more than any other creature, mediates through her son the divine acts he accomplished and that Chika accomplished and the gift of living in the divine will to all creatures. Take, for example, volume 23, December 1st, 1927. Jesus reveals, the Holy Queen received everything from my will. The fullness of grace, of sanctity, of sovereignty over everything, and even the fruition that gives life to her son. My will communicated to her everything and denied her nothing. My daughter, all the acts that my Holy Queen Mother accomplished in my will are awaiting their actualization. They await the retinue of each soul's acts to have yet to be accomplished in my will. So these are the acts that come to your aid whenever you accomplish your acts in my will. Furthermore, each of Mary's acts lines itself up around you to give itself to you. Some give you light, others grace, some sanctity, and yet others the very act that you wish to accomplish. So as to actualize in you the retinue of these noble, holy, and divine acts. These acts are the outpouring of God, who administering them to the soul enables it to be so filled with them that it is unable to contain them. In this way, the soul pours them out anew and offers its divine acts to its creator. There is no blessing that does not descend through these acts accomplished in my divine will. The heavenly sovereign woman awaits the actualization of the retinue of her acts so as to move God to make us make our supreme will come to reign on earth. So here the Lord is stating that Mary's acts that come from God and that she accomplished in her humanity through the eternal power and will of God await each soul's act. Because Mary wants to impart to our acts the merit of her acts, and Jesus the merit of his acts. And these acts of Jesus and Mary come to our aid whenever we accomplish our acts in his will. And each of Mary's acts line themselves up to give themselves to us. And these acts give us light, grace, sanctity, and assist us in the very acts we accomplish so that Mary and Jesus' acts may be actualized in us. And these acts are the outpouring of God who wishes to fill our soul with them. Now why do Jesus and Mary wish to communicate their acts to our acts? Because they empower our acts. They enable our acts to become divine, divinized, and eternal. Consider analogously a child wishing to learn how to swing a baseball bat, or ride a bicycle, or drive a car. Now let's take a bicycle, for example. The child does not know how to balance the bicycle initially, so the father or the mother will hold the bars or sit behind the child and enable the child to balance the bike and pedal at the same time. Well, that is a small intimation of the acts of the parent empowering the acts of the child magnified a millionfold are the divine acts of God's divine will operating in our finite acts in an invisible immaterial manner we don't see them we don't touch them but 
they are more real than those acts we see and touch. These acts occur within the will of the soul of the human being. With the consent and cooperation of the soul's intellect and memory and will, of course. So we must invite God to operate within us with his own divine acts. And this synergetic operation, that is the operation of God in man, which is a theandric operation, transforms the soul into another Christ and establishes within it a triune indwelling whereby the Father operates in the will. The Son operates in the intellect and the Spirit operates in the memory. And this operation, although spiritual, extends itself to the body where the Father beats in the human heart. The soul consents to the son's movement in its lifeblood and to the spirit's motion in its breath. Now, this synergetic operation, so to speak, is also alluded to in the writings of Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Saint Maximilian Kolbe foretold a period when the Blessed Virgin Mary in the end times would come to the aid of the human race. I wish to pull this quote up for you so that you get a better understanding of the role Mary is playing in these end times for us. Exonium Colby states, the Holy Spirit is Mary's spirit. Far from being alienated in her personality because of the dominance of the Holy Spirit, she is on the contrary more than any other creature in full possession of herself. She lives in a state of divine synergy with the Holy Spirit. And in presenting the future church as a holy and immaculate bride for Christ, Saint Paul uses the Greek word immaculate, immaculatus in Latin, and attributes it to the Blessed Virgin Mary as if to designate Mary as the prototype of the future church. Now, the servant of God, Luisa Picareta, picks up this theme as well. Oh, by the way, with respect to the Blessed Virgin Mary being the prototype of the future church in its holiness, this is also taught by the Second Vatican Council document, Lumen Gentium, Article 63. It states, the Blessed Virgin is a type of the church in the order of faith, charity, and perfect union with Christ. And the Catholic Catechism, Article 972, 